because instead of magnifying Christ, instead of exalting Christ, you're busy exalting different human teachers, different departments. Say, I like the Sunday school, or, you know, I like this, or I like that, uh, rather than exalting in the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul has you know, five things I picked out in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 that Paul says that uh, should happen because we're still dealing, the first four chapters deal with the undue exaltation of human beings. The undue exaltation of human beings. So Paul says, number one, he says, we ministers, we ought to look like ministers and stewards. uh, He said, we ought to look like, people ought to be able to look at our lives and then reasonably come to the conclusion that we represent Jesus. Number two, he says, stop thinking of human beings above what is written. Don't think more about human beings than what the Bible says. Number three, Paul says, be willing to become a fool for Christ's sake. See, when folks talk about you, run you down, or they say bad things about you, and they think that you're not that smart, uh, no matter what they say, Paul said, be willing to become a fool for Christ's sake. Because remember, in the first chapter, he said that the wisdom of men is foolishness with God. So if you think I'm a fool and you're using human wisdom, then God must think I'm wise. So don't get upset, excited, and feel like you need to give up because uh, what people say about you. Amen. Stop worrying about what folks say about you. They ain't paying your bills anyway. What you worried about is somebody talking about you. It'd be different if they, if they stopped by with a check every week. They ain't giving you nothing. They ain't doing nothing for you. They're just talking about you. So look, as long as you're you, you talking but you ain't helping me in the walking, I ain't worried about what you say. Amen. So we ought to look like we represent Christ, and we ought to stop thinking about human beings above which is written, and then be willing to be a fool for Christ's sake. Now, Paul is speaking, uh, he's using satire. See, we're not really foolish. Remember in the chapter 1, he says, in chapter 2, we speak hidden wisdom, but the world, can't, the world doesn't like it because it doesn't fit what they want. Amen. Amen. See, I mean, one time a guy told me, and I told you about this a long time ago, the guy said to me, he said, man, you should be a doctor or a lawyer, or, uh, and you ought to run for political office, these kind of things. And I said, man, I wouldn't step down from being a pastor to do those things. <laughs> he said, you a fool. <laughs> he said, what you do ain't important. See, and I got it. He, amen. He don't know the Lord. He don't know the Lord. He don't know what. He don't, uh, he's placed all his eggs in this temporary basket. And all of us know when we get a little older, the problem with putting all your eggs in a basket is after a while, eggs spoil. Amen. Even if you put the basket in the refrigerator, they ain't lasted but so long. Amen. Yeah, so you, you got to put your hopes, as the songwriter said, build your hopes on things eternal. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. Amen. So be a fool for Christ's sake. Number four, he said, imitate your spiritual father or mother. See, and now Paul speaks with hyperbole because the Bible uses hyperbole. You know, the Bible is good for saying things the way we say things. Say, you know, uh, he was kung fu fighting. He was fast as lightning. You know, that kind of, you know what I'm saying? So Paul says, you can have 10,000 teachers. You only got one daddy. And that's me. (laughs) So you got to follow. You remember Paul told Timothy? 
Follow your mother, your grandmother. See, you need to follow people who have... Who are, in, who are interested in you, who have birthed you, who are taking care of you. You see, any jack leg preacher can come around and tell you something, but he don't care about you. Paul says, you got 10,000 instructors, but you only got one daddy. You only got one daddy that's going to take care of you. You only got one daddy that's going to the deep uh, in the ocean. You only got one daddy that's going through all this for you. You only got one daddy that's sacrificing. The reason you got clothes on your back is because I may not have clothes on my back. You only got one daddy. So Paul says, follow your daddy. Amen. This is not hard for us to understand. The the person who really cares about me is going to give up because if you're good parents, you know, for the years that your children, you're raising them, you give up more for them than you do for you. Because you're the real mama and daddy. Amen. Amen. Somebody else's mom and daddy ain't giving up like that. So Paul says, you need to pay attention to me. Because you got, everybody wants to give you information. Everybody wants to instruct you. Everybody has something to say, but I'm the only one caring. And when Paul says, I, it means I and the group that's with him. And last, number five, is this. The kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. The kingdom of God is not in word. Now, this is all in the fourth chapter of 1 Corinthians. And if you take time uh, to read it, so this Christmas, I'm saying, you know what? I'm going to be a fool for Christ's sake. How about y'all joining me? I'm going to be a fool for Christ's sake. So this this Christmas season, I want to look like I'm representing Jesus. And and so when it comes to the Christmas season, I don't want to think of Christmas above what is written. All right? And then uh, I may look like the Grinch that stole Christmas, but I am not I'm stolen Christmas. I might have stolen uh, what is commercial Christmas, financial Christmas, get in debt Christmas, try to buy gifts Christmas. Yeah, so uh, you know what? Uh, so I may look like I'm a fool for Christ's sake. But you know, Christmas is a great holiday for me because when you not when you don't have to be involved in trying to figure out all these gifts to buy and all this and what they gonna get me and then I got gotta get a similar gift and that's why folks have you know they, they hate Christmas because it, it, this is not what Christmas is all about. It's about the incarnation. Amen. Amen. God the Son became the, a man so that we, the sons of men, might become sons and daughters of God. The incarnation, that's what it's all about. Amen. And then uh, follow people who have a great word of God and have really sacrificed for you. That's the idea. Okay, and then number five, the kingdom of God is not in word, but it's in power. So, so this, Christmas celebra- uh, this Christmas year, we're almost celebrate not in word. You know, by word, just talking to talk. Power. 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 Because that's what, what counts. That's what the, what the kingdom is all about. It's not about people coming to talk. If, you know, if, uh, if all God wanted to do was talk to us, he could have stopped with the prophets. <laughs> prophets come along, thus saith the Lord. That's not where he stopped at. He stopped at the incarnation when the Son of God became a Son of Man so that he could save us. Thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, God with us, because he saves us. From our sins. All right. All right. So when we look at this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, let me go back to verse 1. 1 Corinthians 4 and uh, the first five verses. 1 Corinthians 4 says, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ. He says, Servants of Christ and stewards for the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Amen? Faithful. See, because we've got to be faithful to our owner. Faithful to our employer. 
You know, when I started General Motors in 1970, they asked me to sign a paper that said that whatever I learned in the plant and all the information and stuff that I signed, and I said, I will not use this information by giving it to Ford or Chrysler. <laughs> I said, you know, I, I, it was a loyalty pact. Amen. See, I'm working for you. You pay me. I'm going to be faithful to you. So if there are suggestions or whatever I have, I'm giving it to you. And so a steward has to be found faithful. And so what we are to look like ministers and stewards. See, from the outside, people ought to look at us and be able to reasonably come to the conclusion that there's a child of God. There's someone that serves God. And so the Bible says in verse uh, 3, But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. Amen. Man's judgment. He says, In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I know nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Amen. God looks at the heart. He's going to the motive. He's going to not only what we do, but why do we do what we do. It's then each one's praise will come from God. Each one's praise, each one's Judah. <laughs> the word Judah means praise. Paul says in the book of Romans, he says that, uh, so when we're really praising God, our Judah, our praise comes from God. Because he says, if you're a real Jew, and he uses a play on words, if you're a real Jew, then your Judah comes from God. In other words, if you're a real Jew, if you're a real Christian, then your praise is one that God is saying, well done. Not the people in the audience. It's all about praising God. So, first of all, in those verses in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 to 5, uh, the word of God, I said before, people should be able to look at us and reasonably come to the conclusion that we are Christian. Of course, now, as Paul was saying later on, now, they may use the wrong method. So if they use the wrong method and if they're wrong in their calculation, don't worry about that. Because, see, many times people are going to judge you by a carnal standard. Don't let that bother you. And he says we ought to be faithful, as we mentioned before. Now, the word minister means under rower. When, you, when uh, we look at that, th at the, and the Bible says, let us consider us as servants of Christ and stewards. Servants, the idea of servant is an under rower. That, that's somebody on a ship. Amen. Down in the bottom of the ship. Okay. And... The man who was leading the cadence will hit on the beat on the drums. Boom, 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 boom. The under rower rows according to that tempo. So if the, if the, if the uh, man on the drums are going boom, 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 you can't be going. Uh. See, and what the Bible is saying is that we need to be, people need to look at our lives and say, here's a person that's directed by the Spirit of God. You know, another way uh, to help us understand, if, if you've seen in the army, you know, you're going to have somebody that calls cadence. So you've got a cadence caller. And uh, so often in a cadence caller, you know, um, then what happens is the leader, someone in charge will call the group to attention, uh, the squad or whatever it is, a caller to, uh, to attention, and we get ready to march. They're called right face, forward, march. And then they may go into double time. Well, you can't be walking along. And the man has said, double time. <laughs> and what the Bible is saying, you see, when God says jump, we need to be saying how high. Our lives ought to be those where we don't make these decisions. In all our ways, we acknowledge him. He directs our path. People ought to be able to look at us, and when they look at us, then they're saying there's a person that's not directed by himself, 
his own knowledge and understanding. He's directed by someone higher than he is. That's why David said, lead me to the rock that's higher than I. Amen. You see, another songwriter said, up above my head, there's music in the air. I really do believe. See, we're, we're walking, we're living our lives according to another musician. Not the music of this world. And so people ought to look at us and determine the, the way we live that we're being directed by God. And what Paul says later on in verses 3 through 5, that, but we are judged by the Lord. Judged by the Lord. See, we can't judge ourselves, and other people can judge us, but maybe they don't have the right to judge us. Let me give an example of, of what I mean. <clears throat> I, I have a friend that's got a lawn business, and it made sense to me to start using a lawn business rather than me out there trying to cut all that grass and spend the hours out there and, you know, with allergies and sneezing and all that. So uh, I, I pay him to do it. And I've had at least two people come by and tell me, I don't like the way he does your yard. I, I, I told my yard man, I said, you know what, uh, I had a couple guys tell me they don't like the way you do my yard. He said, well, how do you feel? I said, I'm fine. I'm fine with it. Well, he ain't going to worry about what's, they ain't paying him. He don't work for them. And that's what Paul is saying. You see, we ought to look like we're doing the job, but then when people judge us carnally, Paul said, it's a, it's a small thing, insignificant. They said, Paul, you're not an apostle. Because an apostle carries himself this way. And they were totally wrong. But what Paul was saying, it's insignificant if you're going to talk about me because you're judging me out of human wisdom. Man's court. Ain't no God in this. you coming about what you think. Now, both of the guys that really complained, they complained because they wanted the job. But I'm happy with what my man is doing. Amen. I'm real happy with it. And so Paul says, therefore, uh, as, my, my, as my yard man asked me, he said, well, tell me, am, am I okay with you? See, he didn't judge himself. He didn't say, I know I'm doing a good job. He said, what do you think? That's why Paul says, I can't judge myself. You see, because if I'm working for Jesus, then, and I say, but I'm doing a great job for Jesus. I don't know. You got to ask Jesus. Is this making sense to you? So Paul said, that's why I don't even judge myself. But I go to the Lord and ask the Lord, how am I doing? You know, people often ask questions, and you know this, uh, that uh, you you around you you around you go we go to funerals we just we go to different parties and all this and people are good but especially if I'm a pastor or if you're a deacon people ask you well how's your church doing <laughs> how's friendship doing and I always I always hesitate stutter well I mean how am I you know you got to ask Jesus I may say man we we on fire for the Lord we tearing it up there. Every Sunday, the Holy Ghost is having a, we having a Holy Ghost fit every Sunday. But I got to, but it's what Jesus is saying, not what I'm saying. And so, amen. So, uh, so that's what Paul is saying. I'm not the final judge myself. And so often then I will say to people, well, uh, it looks like we're doing pretty good. I can go back to, it looks like people are being accountable and living the Christian life. That's what it looks like. But you've got you to ask Jesus. You, you're really asking, because I can't judge the motives, what's on in people's heart. Paul says, when I judge your heart and bring out the secret hidden things. Amen. So again, I'm saying, see, that, that's a great judgment. Now, Paul talked about this in the third chapter. He said, somebody build wood, hay, and stubble, going to burn up. But you may be building... Uh, gold, silver, and precious uh, gems. See, Paul said, when I came to Corinth, I built this church on Jesus. Now, others are going to follow. Now, they can build with their own self, 
or they can build with Jesus. And uh, the, pro- the thing is, though, if you build it on self, then you know it's not going to last. Amen. It's not, it's not going to last. And, and often the biggest test and the greatest proof that you're building on Jesus is when a man has been a, a place as long as I've been, and then if God, whatever God does, and I leave, and people keep on following Jesus. And don't try to follow the man. Amen. That's what it's all about. I love John the Baptist's ministry because the Bible says John had collected quite a few people. And all John had to do was say, there's the one you got to be following. People left him and joined Jesus. You see, that man was doing a great job. That, because when Jesus showed up, John said, I'm not supposed to get this kind of glory. And people stopped following John and stopped following Jesus, which meant that John's ministry was pointing them to Jesus all the time. Amen. Amen. You know, somebody, something else happened. Uh, you know, uh, at different times, I remember uh, someone was saying to me, and they said it so they would get back to me. You know how that happens. It wasn't really said to me, but it was said so it would get back to me. And someone said, you know, a certain person runs Friendship Baptist Church in Girard. And they asked me, I uh, said, that's, that's what so-and-so said, that a certain person runs Friendship. I know all y'all thinking, who was that? <laughs> but here's a, someone asked me, what do, you, what do I think? I said, insignificant. I said, I'm going to tell you right now, the Holy Ghost runs Friendship. <laughs> because sometimes the people you're talking about, didn't have anything to do with, with major decisions. When we went debt free, the persons you're talking about had nothing to do with that. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? I said, listen, every deacon's meeting, a trustee meeting, we sit down trying to figure out what the Holy Ghost is saying. I like the old term, Holy Ghost. Amen? So when, when we get through, we don't stop meeting until the Holy Ghost tells us. So when you say a certain person is running friendship, obviously you don't have a clue. I don't even, I'm not going to address that. Amen. Amen. Because we've been in situations where I thought one thing and a deacon thought something else. And so when we met, then uh, what happened was because of the Holy Spirit hadn't brought unity, we didn't move. Because we studied through uh, Henry Blackaby. How to, how to experience God in the church. So when someone says a certain person runs friendship, you know, it's an insignificant thing. Don't let people talk about you and give you a headache. Bring your blood pressure up. Now you're trying to, you're trying to well, I, I got to deal with that. I, it's, Paul said it's insignificant. It doesn't mean a thing. Amen. So Paul says the final person is Jesus. Now if Jesus is saying we're wrong, now I got a problem. I need to repent and get right with God. Okay? So that, that's number one. We're to look like ministers and stewards. Number two, do not think of human beings above what is written. We're talking about being a fool for, for Christ's sake this Christmas season. Amen. Amen. Being a fool. So it doesn't matter what folks think. Number one, again, is that uh, we, we're trying to look like we're Christians because we want it to happen from the inside out. And when it goes from the inside out, guess what? It's going to look like it from the outside in. Amen. Number two, uh, in verses six to eight, do not think of human beings above that which is written. First Corinthians chapter four and uh, verse six, where Paul says he's a fool for Christ's sake. Through this passage, we get to verse nine and ten. He said now in verse 6, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us <laughs> not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. Now, you know what, see, you know why there's divisions in the church? Because once we start siding up with human beings, amen, 
Somebody asked me about uh, d- different things, and, uh, you know, I tell people, listen, you bring politics in the church, you're going to have Christians who are Democratic and Christians who are Republicans, and you're going to start a mess that you can't deal with because it doesn't belong, first and foremost, in the church. Who you voting for and all that kind of stuff, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, there, there are concerns that all of us have, but the church wasn't instituted to bring in a political leader. You see what I'm saying? So Paul says, now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos. Because, see, both these guys are top-notch leaders. And the natural tendency for human beings is to choose sides. Amen. Amen. I uh, I love uh, to go down to YMCA and, you know, and, and just uh, meet and talk to people. I'll try to, always trying to lead people to Christ. And so uh, we had a big discussion a couple uh, last week or so. And I told everybody, everybody, y'all listen to this now. I said, I want you to listen to this. I said, y'all think I'm a pretty good sports fan and know quite a bit. And I got a guy over here that we all, we, we usually disagree. I said, but listen, you know what? This, this wasn't the gospel. We talking about sports. It ain't the gospel. I just have an opinion. Now, when it comes to the gospel, it's thus saith the Lord. I said, but let me tell you how wrong I can be. I said, when LeBron James come out of high school, I wanted the Cavs to pick Carmelo Anthony. (laughs) I said, that brother come out of college one year. They won a championship Man, I know LeBron is, man, take Carmelo. I said, and then when, when uh, Kyrie Irving come along, I said, don't draft him number one. He's too short. That boy can't play no ball. You need, a, you need somebody big. And I said, so anytime you think I know about sports, remember, the Cavs would have never had LeBron and never had Kyrie if they listened to me. <laughs> I just got an opinion like everybody else. Now, when it comes to Jesus, amen, that's different. So, look, you can't put your trust in human beings who don't have the Spirit of God. Our Sunday school lesson today, uh, there was a part when you open up and you start looking at things, and and, uh, one of the first things that caught my attention was they had gifted men. Anybody? Gifted men. I said, you got to understand that right now, gifted men. So, again, I go back to basketball, and I say, and I say, Le- man, LeBron is a gifted basketball player. And that talent belongs to him. And he's worked, you know what I'm saying? So he's gifted, all right? And even if it, God gives him the talent, yet he's gifted. The difference in the church when we talk about gifted men and women, see, LeBron has the talent. We don't have any talent. We're gifted because it's on loan. (laughs) God has given it to us. But, but you know, you remember when when uh, uh, Elijah had this story and a guy was swinging an axe. And they're, they're, they're cutting down trees. And the axe head fell off. Okay? And Elijah, Elisha said, the man cried out, alas! It's borrowed, all right? It don't belong to me. I borrowed this. Uh, Elisha made a way that the axe head, the iron, did swim, came up to the surface. My point to that, in that whole story is that, yeah, I may have the gift of the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't belong to me. It's borrowed. It's not mine. This talent is not inherent in me. It's the Holy Spirit who confers this upon you and me. That's why, as our sister was saying, everybody in the church is to be committed because it's not, no, none of us have talent that we have in and of ourselves. It's not of us. It's the Spirit of God who confers this talent. And he can confer it on anybody, any saint that he wants to. And the, and the talent comes from God. It's not ours. It's on loan. It belongs to Jesus. And so anybody he wants to, he can set up 
and make them have miraculous ministry. Amen. So there, all of us are talented. We're gifted because when you get saved, the Holy Spirit uh, gives you a gift. You got at least one gift. And most of you, it's a combination of gifts. And God uses you in a combination of ways. But that using you belongs to the power of the Holy Spirit, not to us. So then, let's think biblically about human beings. And again, start out realizing that none of us would be anything if it wasn't for God. And then we need to stop being puffed up for one against another. Puffed up. You know, you know I, I puffed up. You know, that's like you blow up a balloon. <laughs> you know, you put air in the balloon, you blow it up. So now that balloon is all puffed up. And sometimes, notice, we can be puffed up for one. So that's what, in other words, stop playing politics in the church. That's what Paul was telling these people. He said, so listen, if so-and-so does something, it's okay. Because you puffed up for him. But if somebody else does the same thing, you have a fit. Because you puffed up against him. You see what I'm saying? Paul said, you got to stop that. Stop thinking of that. Because we all come together, we are saints who've been saved by grace. So because of their situations, then in verses 6 through 8, they thought that they were already full. They thought they were rich. And they thought they were reigning as kings. And that's what Paul is saying. He's speaking satirically. If you go to 1 Corinthians 4 and 7, he's speaking, uh, you know, in a satire, you know, that, uh, that he says, for who makes you to differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Yeah, this love and this, this joy that you have, the world didn't give it, but it came from God. The world can't take it away. But it's not yours, it's the fruit of the Spirit. See, it's not called the fruit of the saint. So we read the scripture, you say, well, here's the fruit of the saint, love. Oh, no, that love ain't come from me. That's the, that comes from the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, and temperance. That's his. It's not mine. It's his. So he's made us to be different. 1 Corinthians 4, 8. The uh, very next verse, and the Bible says, you are already full. You're already rich. You have reigned as kings without us. You see, the, uh, the message that they were listening to was that they were fine. You're okay. Everything is all right. And, you know, we've heard that same message. If you are a child of the king, then you ought to have this, this and you ought to have that. I ought to have a new house, house, new car, new clothes. Because, see, how are you going to convince somebody about Jesus unless you've got all these uh, worldly things? That's false teaching. He says, you've reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish that you did reign, that we also might reign with you. There's the apostle speaking in a satire. In other words, he's saying, if you're really reigning, then we would be reigning, which would mean we we into the kingdom, period. But since we're not into the kingdom yet, we're not reigning, and neither are you reigning. Amen. So we need to make sure that we lift Jesus and don't, and don't lift ourselves. Amen. Lift Jesus and not ourselves. Let me look at one more, uh, and that is to be a fool for Christ's sake. And we'll get more into this. This Christmas season, being a fool, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and uh, let's look at verse 9 through 13, and we'll be through for this day. He says, For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last, as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. Now, before we move on, let me help you. Paul is talking to people who understood Roman gladiators. And so when you had people who were captured by, you know, uh, certain countries or whatever, then they would take some captured men 
and they would uh, lead them to the circus, the circus Maximus, lead them to the theater. And the people were going to be cheer, jeering and cheering and all this. You know, they would cheer for the wild animals, the lions. They weren't cheering for the Christians. And so what happens is Paul has said, while you are reigning, we're fools for Christ's sake because God has displayed us. The apostles last as men condemned to death. So listen, when you put me in the arena and all I got on is, is the clothes on my back and you let lions loose, I don't think I'm going to win that battle. And so he's men condemned to death. We have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels. And guess what? So I'm out there, you out there, and you fighting against lions or, or uh, gladiators with all kinds of, uh, of a skill. And you are there because you condemned to die. You're not going to beat the, You're not winning this fight. So Paul says, real apostles in my day, he says, you know what? He says, God has put us on display. And the word last here has the idea you would have a lot of things going on, but just like when we do boxing today, now for the final event, the event of the, that you all come out to see, and in this corner, so and so, the apostles, they're saying, you put the condemned men last, and they're condemned to death. Everybody's waiting for the lions to attack them and all this. Go to First uh, Corinthians 4.10, verse 10. Paul says, we are fools for Christ's sake. But you are wise in Christ. We are weak. You are strong. We are dis, we are, uh, you are distinguished. We're dishonored. You see what he said? Those are the marks of an apostleship, of, of an apostle. Look at verse 11. He says, to this present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. So you want to be an apostle? Look at verse 12. And we work. The word labor means to labor to the point of exhaustion. Working with our own hands. Being reviled. When people talk about us, we don't talk back. We bless. Being persecuted, we endure. That's why Paul says, we must be fools. We're fools for Christ's sake. I mean, we, we're condemned to death. We're working and, getting up and, we, and not getting paid. We're doing all this. And verse 13, 1 Corinthians 4, 13, the Bible says, being defamed, we entreat. You know, you talk about me. Guess what we do? We entreat. We have been made the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things until now. Paul says, that's what I mean when I say we're a fool for Christ's sake. See, we don't, it's not about us getting reward, not about us being looked at and honored. It's about us serving Christ even when we look crazy, even when we work hard and, and there's no reward. He said, we are fools for Christ's sake. Amen. That's what he's talking about. Fools for Christ's sake. But he goes on, and when you look at this, you go back to verse 1, you go back to Paul's life, and Paul says, but he saved my soul. He, he goes back and he, he, his testimony is, I was on the road to Damascus. And we wind it up. I'm on the road to Damascus. You know what? I'm out of the will of God. But the Lord Jesus appeared. And when Jesus appeared, I said, who art thou, Lord? And what would thou have me to do? So his testimony after that was, I lived my life in the light of this vision. And therefore, I can be a fool for Christ's sake. Because I was out of the will of God, not doing the will of God. I should have been destroyed. I should have ended up in hell. But Jesus Christ turned me around. Paul said he had mercy on me. And so when you look at God's mercy versus being a fool for Christ's sake, you look at God's mercy and you say, I'm going to be a fool for Christ's sake. It's a no-brainer. Because the mercy of God 
has changed me. And I'm okay to be a fool for God's sake, for Christ's sake. Because when I look at it, when I think about Jesus, amen. When I think about the one who saved me, amen. Paul said, I got mercy. Mercy. You know, now we look at grace and mercy and we say that uh, grace is unmerited favor and kindness, yes. And often we'll say, but mercy, uh, mercy is we didn't get punished like we should have. And that's true, but mercy is deeper than that. Mercy comes along when grace hasn't failed, when grace has failed. See, grace is unmerited favor and kindness. A couple years ago, I was uh, talking to a fellow at at high school, and uh, he told me that he was being mistreated, all this. Uh, Teacher wasn't helping him, and I said, well, brother, let me come help you. Uh, I go to class. So I went to class. I showed that young fellow how to do the problems. He understood it. And I said to him, try number two. And he said, I ain't doing that. That's too much work. Unmerited favor and kindness. That's what grace is. I didn't have to do that. Okay? So I told him, well, I'm gone too then. I walked. He sinned against grace. You with me? Now, if I would have gone back and said, brother, what you don't understand is how you messing your life up. And I'm going to work with you some more because I know what you don't know. And I know how, in, how this is going to impact your life. And so, therefore, even though I've given you grace, but now I'm going to have mercy and be compassionate and work with you some more. Even though you have told me you're not going to do it, I'm going to find a way to make you help you do it. That's what mercy is. Because the word mercy means compassion. So the Bible says, Paul says, see, if he, I've been saved by grace. But he tells Titus, we were saved by mercy. Because when grace failed... Jesus kept on coming. So in 1970, and I promised God, I'm getting back in the church. And I didn't. That was grace. 1972, I said, yeah, Lord, I got my, my, my first child is born. That little Beth Ann. I'm, okay, I know where I belong. I'm going back to church. In 1974, God showed me some mercy. And he said, I've given you grace, but I'm going to give you some mercy because I know, look at your life, and I have compassion on you. You and your wife are not getting along. You're all ready to get a divorce. This ain't working. You hate your job. You're miserable. You are messed up. You hate going to GM. You can't stand it. You have developed a situation now, a physical situation, because you can't take what's going on. But I got compassion on you. And by my mercy, I'm going to reach down and change your life anyhow. That's what mercy is. And so Paul says, yeah, Paul says, this, it's not by works of righteousness which we've done. He said, don't you know we were hateful, we were hating, we were backbiting, we were miserable, all that we were into And we we began to realize that life, I said to myself, if I got to live this way for the rest of my life, life ain't worth it. I can't stand this. I hate it. And God stepped in with mercy and compassion and saved my soul, not by any works, but he had compassion. He said, no longer will I allow you to be miserable and hating and backbiting and and all this, but I'm going to change your life. The Bible says it was mercy. Mercy. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. And when I look back on my life and I say, mercy, a fool for Christ's sake. It ain't hard to be a fool for Christ's sake. Because that's just that little bit of thing about being a fool for Christ's sake. And I look at that whole lot of mercy. I'm the benefactor. I'm the benefactor. His mercy endureth. 
forever. My brothers and sisters, look, you look at how far God has brought you. Not only by his grace, but he's been merciful to you. Because when you were lost and didn't know how to get out of the mess you were in, amen, you didn't find Jesus, he found you. Amen. He turns your life around. And where there was miserable, uh, you were miserable, all this, undone, a wretch, he turned that into joy, gave you stability, took your, uh, your, your, your feet out to miry clay, placed them on a solid rock, and now we give him praise, honor, and glory. He's worthy to be praised. Mercy. Amen. Mercy. Thank God. And so I determined this year, I determined, man, I need to be a fool for Christ's sake. Amen. Because of how good he is. Amen. Praise the Lord. Many of you know, but uh, in my, uh, this for December the 1st, I had my, uh, what do you call that, the annual exam. And uh, the doctor was going through some things, and he, he, he said, okay, I'll see you in three months. And as I got started to walk out, he said, wait, hold up, hold up, hold up. He said, you got blood in your urine. And many of you know that. So I went home and I checked that. I got on the Internet right away. I said, it could be anything from kidney stone to cancer. And I had to go back Wednesday. And he he said, okay, uh, you've tested positive another time. And so I had to go back Friday. And when I went back Friday, he says, the the, uh, preliminary results of all of this ultrasound and all this there's no mass and there's no cancer so as i walked out the office and uh, and i began to think uh about how good god is <clears throat> but i had had to, but i uh, but i prayed about this i said i got to tell i got to tell mom and so maybe i'll just wait Nah, as I prayed about it, I wanted to tell her. So that gave her a chance to cry and pray. She called me back about a day after and said, God told me you're going to be fine. (laughs) Amen. You're going to be fine. And then I mentioned it on Wednesday night. Sister Joyce uh, said to me, I said, I I got this down, but I got to drink 40 ounces of of water. That's the purpose I'm telling you this. And so Joyce said, that's usually done in about an hour. See, what I was going to do was start drinking the water about three or four hours before I had to go. And I, but Joyce said, no, that's done the hour. And so I was able to deal with that, not a problem. If I'd have done it my way, I'm going to have serious problems. Because this old man... <laughs> <laughs> but when I share things with the people of God, I got information that I didn't, I wouldn't have had. And see, Sister Cynthia keeps saying to us, "See, isolation is the devil's workshop." So I was going into this, this, to this ultrasound. My mother had already told me. God told me you're gonna be fine. I said, "Well, he wouldn't lie to my mother." <laughs> Sister Joyce told me, here's how you do this. My point is that when we share with one another, what happens is you get information that you did not have. And God has got a body that wants to work with you. And so I know people were were praying, but I was fine before the doctor gave me the information because the doctor had already talked to my mother, and and then he had already helped me uh, through Joyce, so I'm going through this thing, and I'm saying, whatever happens is of the Lord. I'm going to trust the Lord and keep on stepping. My, and so, brothers and sisters, when you're going through stuff, realize that you've got a whole family who cares for you. you got people, and, and, and they're not going to gossip. The people are going to pray for you. You need to have somebody give you some information. And like I say, I, it was so much easier when the saints of God rallied around me and said, here's, what you, here's how you do this. Because I was getting ready to mess up. I, I wouldn't have been able to do this the, uh, the way that I had planned. You've got to talk to one another. 
that's what Paul says. He says that, listen, I'll be a fool for Christ's sake. Because uh, somebody told me, they said, you shouldn't tell your information to other folks. I said, I'm going to tell you something. I got a body of Christ. You got a body. You got folks who love you, and they can help you. And it's good to know somebody's praying for you. So when you're going through trouble in your way, and you got to cry sometimes, you lay awake at night, but that's all right. You tell Jesus and then tell somebody else with some skin on who you know can pray for you and help you because you're not called to walk this thing all by yourself. Amen. What a mighty God we have. What a mighty God we have. So, brothers that's my, brothers and sisters, that's my point. You got folks that love you, care for you, and will walk with you. Amen. Back in the day, as I stopped, back in the day, y'all don't remember this. This is way before your time. A guy named Roy Hamilton sang a song, You'll Never Walk Alone. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, don't walk alone. Walk with Jesus. Father, we thank you for this word. Thank you for your time in the word. And we pray this year that we will be brothers and sisters of Christ who will be a fool for Christ's sake.